the Black Dog Chronicles is open for your talent. Interested? Listen out for the special message at the end of this video. This story is dedicated to Carlotta Z. Thank you very much for all of your support over the years. The Coat by A. E. D. Smith Read for you by Hugh Carr I am quite aware that the other fellows in the office regard me as something of an oddity, as being rather a queer bird, in fact. Well, of course, a man who happens to be of a studious disposition, who dislikes noise and prefers his own company to that of empty-headed companions, and who, moreover, is compelled by defective vision to wear thick glasses, is always liable to be thus misjudged by inferior minds. And ordinarily, I treat the opinion of my colleagues with the contempt it deserves. But at this particular moment, I was beginning to think that perhaps, after all, there might be something to be said for their view. For though I might still repudiate the queer bird part of the business, Undoubtedly, I was an ass, a first-class chump. Otherwise, I would have been spending my holidays in a nice, comfortable way with the rest of the normal world, winking at the girls on the promenade of some seaside resort at home, instead of having elected to set out alone on this idiotic push-bike tour of a little-known part of France, drenched, hungry, and lost, a stranger in a strange land, dispiritedly pushing before me a heavily laden bicycle with a gashed tire, such was the present state of my asinine choice. The storm had overtaken me miles from anywhere, on a wild road over a spur of the Vosges, and for nearly two hours I had trudged through the pelting rain without encountering a living soul, or the least sign of human habitation. And then, at long last, rounding a bend, I glimpsed just ahead of me the chimney pots and gables of a fair-sized house. It was a lonely, desolate-looking place standing amid a clump of trees a little way back from the road, and somehow, even at a distance, did not convey a very inviting impression. Nevertheless, in that wilderness, it was a welcome enough sight, and in the hope of finding temporary shelter and possibly a little badly needed refreshment, I quickened my pace towards it. Two hundred yards brought me to the entrance gates, and here I suffered a grievous disappointment, for the roofless porter's lodge, the dilapidated old gates hanging askew on their hinges, and the overgrown drive beyond, plainly indicated that the place was no longer inhabited. I speedily comforted myself, however, with the reflection that, in the circumstances, even a deserted house was not to be despised as a refuge. Once, under cover of some kind, I might make shift and wring out my drenched clothing and repair my damaged mount, and without further ado I pushed my bicycle up the long neglected drive and reached the terrace in front of the house itself. It proved to be an old chateau half smothered in creepers and vines that had long gone wild. And judging by the carved stone coat of arms over the main entrance, had once been occupied by a person of some quality. Mounted on a pedestal on either side of the iron-studded front door, stood a rusty carronade, trophies probably, 
of some long-forgotten war in which the former occupier had played a part. Most of the windows had been boarded up, and it was evident that the place had stood empty for many years. I tried the front door. To my surprise, it was unfastened, and a thrust of my shoulder sent it creaking grudgingly back on its hinges. My nostrils, as I stepped into the dim, wide hall, were at once assailed by the stale, disagreeable odor of rotting woodwork and moldy hangings and carpets. For a moment or two, I stood peering uncertainly about me with the slight feeling of eeriness that one usually experiences when entering an old, empty house. Facing me was a broad staircase with a long stained glass window almost opaque with dirt and cobwebs at its head. I mounted the stairs and throwing open the first door at hand, found myself looking into a spacious, handsomely furnished room that had evidently once been the chief apartment of the house, though long neglect and disuse had now reduced it to a sorry state. The ornate cornice hung here and there in strips, and in one corner the plaster of the ceiling had come down altogether. Green mold covered the 18th century furniture. Curtains and draperies hung in tatters, and one half of the beautiful old Persian carpet from a point near the door right across to the fireplace was covered by an evil-smelling bright orange fungus. The fireplace gave me an idea. Could I but find fuel, I might light a fire, make myself a hot drink and get my clothes properly dried. A little searching in the outbuildings discovered a sufficient quantity of old sticks to serve my purpose, and with a bundle of them under my coat I re-entered the house and briskly made my way upstairs again, but on the threshold of the big room, without quite knowing why, I suddenly checked. It was as though my legs of their own volition had all at once become reluctant to carry me further into the apartment, as if something quite outside of me were urging me to turn about and retreat. I laid the sticks down at my feet, and for a moment or two stood there uncertainly in the doorway. I was beginning to sense some subtle suggestion of danger in the atmosphere of the place. Everything was apparently just as I had left it, yet I had an uneasy sort of feeling that during my brief absence something evil had entered the room and left it again. I am neither a nervous nor a superstitious person, yet I found myself a moment later rather shamefacedly picking up my sticks and moving back towards the head of the stairs. Actually, it was not so much fear as a vague, precautionary sense of uneasiness that prompted me. It had occurred to me that perhaps I might feel more comfortable if I remained nearer to the front door and made my fire in one of the rooms on the ground floor. If it was an idiotic fancy, I know, but, well, if anything uh, queer did happen and I had to make a sudden bolt for it, I could get out quicker that way. It was on this second descent of the stairs, as I faced the light from the open front door, that I suddenly noticed something that pulled me up with a decided start. Running up the center of the staircase, and quite fresh in the thick dust, was a broad, broken sort of track exactly as though someone had recently trailed up an empty sack or something of that nature. From the foot of the staircase, I traced this track across the hall to a spot immediately below an old moth-eaten coat that hung from one of a row of coat pegs on the opposite wall. And then I saw that similar tracks traversed the hall in various directions, 
some terminating before the doors on either side, others leading past the foot of the stairs to the rear regions of the house, but all seeming to radiate from the same point below the copex. And the queerest thing about it was that of footprints other than my own. There was not a sign. Uneasiness once more assailed me. The house appeared to be uninhabited, and yet, plainly, someone, or something, had recently been in the place. Who or what was the restless, questing creature that had made those strange tracks to and from the old coat? Was it some half-witted vagrant? A woman, possibly? whose trailing draperies obliterated her own footprints, I had a closer look at the old garment. It was a military greatcoat of ancient pattern, with one or two tarnished silver buttons still attached to it, and had, evidently, seen much service. Turning it round on its peg with a gingerly finger and thumb, I discovered that just below the left shoulder, there was a round hole as big as a penny, surrounded by an area of scorched and stained cloth, as though a heavy pistol had been fired into it at point-blank range. If a pistol bullet had indeed made that hole, then obviously the old coat at one period of its existence had clothed a dead man. A sudden repugnance for the thing overcame me, and with a slight shudder I let go of it. It may have been fancy or not, but all at once it seemed to me that there was more than the odor of mold and rotting cloth emanating from the thing, that there was a taint of putrefying flesh and bone, a taint of animal corruption faint but unmistakable. I could sniff it in the air, and with it, something less definable but no less real. A sort of sixth sense feeling that the whole atmosphere of the place was slowly becoming charged with evil emanations from a black and shameful past. With an effort, I pulled myself together. After all, what was there to be scared about? I had no need to fear human marauders, for in my hip pocket I carried a small but serviceable automatic. And as for ghosts, well, if such existed, they didn't usually walk in the daytime. The place certainly felt creepy, and I shouldn't have cared to spend the night there, but it would be ridiculous to allow mere idle fancies to drive me out again into that beastly rain before I'd made myself that badly needed hot drink and mended my bicycle. I therefore opened the door nearest to me and entered a smallish room that apparently had once been used as a study. The fireplace was on the side opposite to the door and the wide ancient grate was still choked with the ashes of the last log consumed there. I picked up the poker a cumbersome old thing with a knob as big as an orange, raked out the ashes and laid my sticks in approved Boy Scout fashion. But the wood was damp, and after I used up half my matches, refused to do more than smolder, whilst a backdraft from the chimney filled the room with smoke. In desperation, I went down on my hands and knees and tried to rouse the embers into flame by blowing on them. In the middle of this irksome operation, I was startled by a sound of movement in the hall. A single soft flop, as though someone had flung down a garment. I was on my feet in a flash, listening with every nerve a taut. No further sound came, and, automatic in hand, I tiptoed to the door. There was nothing in the hall, nothing to be heard at all save the steady swish of the rain outside. 
but from a spot on the floor directly below the old coat, the dust was rising in a little eddying cloud, as though it had just been disturbed. Ha! A rat! I told myself, and went back to my task. More vigorous blowing on the embers, more raking and poking, more striking of matches. And in the midst of it, again, came that curious noise. Not very loud, but plain and unmistakable. Once more I went into the hall, and once more, except for another little cloud of dust rising from precisely the same spot as before, there was nothing to be seen. But that sixth sense of imminent danger was becoming more insistent. I had the feeling now that I was no longer alone in the old empty hall. That some unclean, invisible presence was lurking there, tainting the very air with its foulness. It's no use, I said to myself. I may be a nervous fool, but I can't stand any more of this. I'll collect my traps and clear out whilst the going's good. With this, I went back into the room, and keeping a nervous eye cocked at the door, began with rather panicky haste to repack my haversack, and just as I was in the act of tightening the last strap, there came from the hall a low, evil chuckle, followed by the sound of stealthy movement. I whipped out my weapon and stood where I was in the middle of the floor, facing the door, with my blood turning to ice. Through the chink between the door hinges I saw a shadow pass. Then the door creaked a little, slowly began to open, and round it there came the coat. It stood there, upright in the doorway, as God is above me. Swaying a little as though uncertain of its balance, collar and shoulders extended as though by an invisible wearer. The old, musty coat I had seen hanging in the hall. For a space that seemed an eternity, I stood like a man of stone, facing the thing as it seemed to pause on the threshold. Dreadful sort of hypnotism held me rooted to the spot on which I stood. A hypnotism that completely paralyzed my body and caused the pistol to slip from my nerveless fingers and yet left my brain clear. Mingled with my frozen terror was a feeling of deadly nausea. I knew that I was in the presence of ultimate evil, that the very aura of the hell-engendered thing reared there in the doorway was contamination, that its actual touch would mean not only the instant destruction of my body, but the everlasting damnation of my soul. Now, it was coming into the room with an indescribable bobbing sort of motion, the empty sleeves jerking grotesquely at its sides, the skirts flopping and trailing in the dust, was slowly coming towards me, and step by step, with my bulging eyes riveted in awful fascination on the thing. I was recoiling before it, step by step, with the rigid, unconscious movement of an automaton. I drew back until I was brought up with my back pressed into the fireplace, and could retreat no further, and still with deadly malevolent purpose, the thing crept towards me. 
The empty sleeves were rising and shakily reaching out towards my throat. In another moment they would touch me. And then I knew with the most dreadful certainty that my reason would snap. A coherent thought somehow came into my burning brain. Something that I had read or heard of long ago. The power of the holy sign against the forces of evil. With a last desperate effort of will, I stretched out a palsied finger and made the sign of the cross. And in that instant, my other hand, scrabbling frenziedly at the wall behind me, came into contact with something cold and hard and round. It was the knob of the old heavy poker. The touch of cold iron seemed to give me instant repossession of my faculties. With lightning swiftness, I swung up the heavy poker and struck with all my force at the nightmare horror before me. And lo, on the instant the thing collapsed and became an old coat, nothing more lying there in a heap at my feet. Yet on my oath, as I cleared the thing in a flying leap and fled from the room, I saw it out of the tail of my eye, gathering itself together and making shape as if it were to scramble after me. Once outside that accursed house, I ran as never man ran before and I remember nothing more until I found myself half fainting before the door of a little inn. Bring wine, in the name of God! I cried, staggering inside. Wine was brought, and a little wondering group stood round me while I drank. I tried to explain to them in my bad French. They continued to regard me with puzzled looks. At length, a look of understanding came into the landlord's face. Mon Dieu, he gasped. Is it possible that Monsieur has been to that place? Quick, Juliette. Monsieur will need another bottle of wine. Later, I got something of the story from the landlord, though he was by no means eager to tell it. The deserted house had once been occupied by a retired officer of the First Napoleon's army. A semi-madman with a strain of African blood in him. Judging from the landlord's story, he must have been one of the worst men that God ever allowed to walk the earth. Most certainly, monsieur. He was a bad man, that one, concluded my host. He killed his wife and tortured everything he could lay his hands on. Even that he said... His own daughters. In the end, one of them shot him in the back. The old chateau has an evil name. If you offered a million francs, you would not get one of our country folks to go near the place. As I have said at the beginning, I know the other fellows in the office are inclined as it is to regard me as being a bit queer. So I haven't told any of them this story. Nevertheless, it's perfectly true. My brand new bicycle and touring maps are probably still lying where I left them in the hall of that devil-ridden chateau. Anybody who cares to collect them <laughs> may keep them. Next time on the Black Dog Chronicles In a psychiatric hospital, dreams become the gateway to cosmic terror. Beyond the Walls of Sleep by H.P. Lovecraft Next time on the Black Dog Chronicles But until then, always Look.
Look out for the shadows. The Black Dog Chronicles is looking for your talent. Would you like to write a story to submit to the channel? Perhaps you'd like to play one of the characters in the upcoming stories. Maybe you would like your artwork to be shown on the channel. If you would like to get involved, then please contact Hugh Carr via the Black Dog Chronicles Facebook group or on Twitter. The links are available in the description below. Make sure you familiarize yourself with the content of the channel before submitting. I look forward to hearing from you.